What's going on guys, my name is Matt, and while this may look like an ordinary vintage audio receiver from the outside, in reality on the inside is actually a very powerful gaming PC. The whole point of this project was to create a gaming PC that could blend in well in a home theater environment. You guys seem to like my PC in an Xbox build, so I figured this could be a good follow up to that. I think the concept of an HT PC is cool, but smacking a regular desktop case next to your media cabinet doesn't look the best in my opinion. Now, I know there are some options on the market that fill this niche, but I wanted to do something unique for mine, and unique this is. Also, this isn't just some parts thrown into a box. I made sure to add a lot of details to make sure this project is in fact unique. For example, the original power button turns on the machine, and when the system turns on, the front frequency chart illuminates as it would have originally. And also, one of my favorite parts is the fact that I was able to make the original volume knob control the PC's volume, and it can be pressed in for play or pause. It's not completely done, there will be a part 2 video, but getting to this point took a lot of effort and I'm super excited to share the process with you. I knew from the get go I wanted to build in some sort of device you might find in a home theater. DVD and VCR players weren't really big enough for my needs and while putting a PC in a console is a cool idea, in practice you'll most times find very high temps and very loud noise output, which definitely isn't something you want in an environment where you're trying to enjoy a movie, some music or a game. After a lot of thought and some napkin math, I came to the conclusion that building a PC and an audio receiver would be the best option. These are plenty big for a capable gaming PC using standard parts, and most come with ventilation built in so creating decent airflow wouldn't be a monumental task. So first came the challenge of finding the audio receiver I would be building the PC in. I had three requirements. One, it had to be broken. I didn't want to be tearing down a working unit because that's just wasteful and would also cost too much, which leads me to requirement two, it needed to be cheap. Other items and mods for this were going to add onto the cost even more and I wanted this to be relatively affordable. And finally, requirement three, it needed to look unique. There were plenty of boring black units from the 2000s, but I wanted something with a little character. Doing some digging around, I found that a lot of old audio equipment had some pretty awesome aesthetics. Stuff like stainless steel, wooden exteriors, and big metal knobs all were very interesting to me. I also like the idea of repurposing an old piece of technology that might have otherwise been sent to the dump, or put in a basement where it would collect dust for years to come. Also using a vintage receiver to me makes it more unassuming. I searched for a long time because finding the right one was very important to me. Unlike a lot of more modern units, most of these old ones don't have much ventilation at all, so when I found this guy, I knew it was the one for me. Meet the old dilapidated audio receiver I purchased off of eBay. This is a broken health kit AR1500 that has definitely seen better days. This was only 10 or 15 bucks, but because this was so heavy, shipping was over $20. I mean, really, this thing is deceptively heavy. It's listed at 21 kilograms, which is over 46 pounds. If this project didn't pan out, I figured I could always just use this as a weight to work out or use it as the world's heaviest paperweight. Jokes aside, a combination of this being heavy and FedEx's lack of care for its packages, this is how it showed up. It was literally ripped open from a heavy impact. There were some dings in the photos, but it was clear there was some extra damage from shipping. There were a few dings and one of the sides of the outer wood panel split off. I could have complained to try and get some of my money back, but it wasn't the seller's fault and this was a very rare find so it's not like he could have just sent me a new one. I initially opened it up and was surprised at how complex the assembly looked on this. I ended up not tearing it down for around a month, which was totally because I wanted the big scary capacitors to lose charge, and not because I procrastinated on doing this project. When I finally did get around to starting the teardown process, I was met with a much bigger challenge than I ever expected. This unit's assembled with five individual outer panels, an inner frame with multiple pieces, and tons of boards all tied into one another. It took multiple hours to tear down, and I even had to cut a part of the inner frame, which I didn't plan on using to access all the screws, nuts, and bolts to completely tear this thing down. Once all the interior pieces and frame were removed, I went ahead and reassembled the outer frame so that I could start figuring out how I was going to fit a PC inside of it. This left me with a blank canvas to work on. I knew that an ITX motherboard, full-size GPU, and SFX power supply would all fit fine, but I decided to take the extra challenge of trying to fit a full-size ATX unit in just because I knew I could make it fit. The biggest challenge I saw was trying to figure out how to mount the GPU. The system was too 
short to fit it in the normal orientation, so I had to come up with another way of mounting it. I thought about making some sort of custom frame, but then I realized I could probably take one of those universal vertical GPU mounts and adapt it to fit this machine. After some research, I ended up buying this one that came with the mount itself and a PCIe riser cable. The GPU gets installed in the mount, then the PCIe extension cable goes into the motherboard. Doing an initial test fit, it looked like it would fit fine, but to make it hug as close to the side panel as possible, I needed to cut a small notch in it. I lined it up and marked out where I need to cut, then used a hacksaw to cut a very small piece off, then rounded the cut over with a file to make sure it wasn't too sharp. And this worked out well and allowed me to finalize where along the side panel I wanted to mount the bracket. Once the mounting location was decided, it was off with the side panel and on with the bracket and clamps. I took my time to make sure everything was aligned exactly how I wanted it to be. I marked out and drilled holes through both of the pieces in two locations. I originally was going to attach these with rivets, but decided to use nuts and bolts to hold them together. I then went ahead and reattached the panel, the PCIe riser, and the card itself. Doing another test fit, it seemed that everything would fit, but it was going to be a tight squeeze. I was super anxious to get onto some of the more fun details like the front illumination and volume control, but I wanted a way to install all of the main parts first before moving on to those things. Installing the motherboard was simple, I drilled four holes in the bottom panel, installed four standoffs, then was able to screw the motherboard into place. With that in, I needed a way to mount the power supply. What I ended up with works, but I think I'll find an extra way of supporting it in the future. I cut down two pieces of angle aluminum the length of the power supply, one for the front and one for the back that the PSU would rest into. I drilled holes through these pieces of aluminum and the bottom panel and was originally going to rivet them together, but couldn't get the rivet tool as close as I needed, so I ended up attaching the piece together with screws. I also drilled a hole for the power supply to mount to the angle bracket. This is the only place that the power supply is tied down to the system, but like I said before, I will be designing extra support in in the future. With the power supply in, it meant all of the main components fit and were mounted to the frame. Now I could move on to some of the details that would make the system truly unique. Most of these had to do with the front panel, and I did things from what I considered the most easy and necessary to the most ambitious. I started with something simple, adding front panel USB 3. After finally figuring out how to completely open up the front assembly, I found that the cutout for these two buttons would be perfect for two USB ports. I had to unattach this large structural piece, then I could take out the two screws for the buttons. Doing a test fit, it looked like a tight squeeze, but I knew I could make it work. I initially tried to glue this into place, but that didn't work, so I drilled some extra holes into the metal and used zip ties to secure the USB ports, which ended up working out out really well. My next goal was to make the frequency chart light up when the PC is on. Originally there were some incandescent bulbs that illuminated the front, but trying to make the original bulbs work didn't make much sense when I could get cheap LEDs to take their place. I got this SATA powered LED kit which could be controlled externally, which I liked the idea of being able to control it with a remote. Putting the strip behind it, you can see the panel illuminates a little bit, but a lot more light was needed to get the effect I wanted. There are a few circular cutouts for the original bulbs, but I needed a long rectangular cutout for my LED strip. I made the cutout using a jigsaw, then drilled some holes for zip ties to go through. I started each of the zip ties, then threaded the LED strip through and tightened it down. Once the metal shroud was back in, I stuck the controller to it and plugged the strip in. I also put the IR receiver in one of the original audio jacks so it was hidden, but still would have line of sight to the remote. This ended up working out really well and I can easily change the brightness with the remote. Once this was done, I moved on to the power button. Each of these buttons clicked in, then pressing it again made them click out. This isn't ideal for a PC because clicking it in will just make it boot cycle. What I found is by pulling out this little metal piece allowed for the switch to act more like a regular PC power switch. Next I used a multimeter to find the pins I need to connect the power leads to. This was pretty simple and only took a few seconds. To go from the switch to the motherboard I used these jumper cables. One wouldn't be enough so I snipped off the ends of two and merged them together by soldering them and heat shrinking each connection 
then the whole thing together. On the first test, I was nervous, but it worked great, and I think it's pretty cool the original power button on the audio receiver powers on the PC. Next came the most ambitious part of the front panel, which was making the volume knob actually control the PC's volume. Each of these knobs turns a potentiometer, and at first I thought I might be able to use the original potentiometer in some way to control the volume, but after some research, I found I would need to physically route the audio signal through it, and overall it wouldn't be worth the effort. I ended up finding a guide by Persa3D on using an Arduino and something called a rotary encoder. This rotary encoder looks like a potentiometer, but it sends out a digital signal. It can be turned indefinitely in either direction, and it can be clicked to act as a button too. The rotary encoder would plug into the Arduino micro, then that would plug into a micro USB cable, then the USB cable would plug into a USB 2 to internal USB 2 connector that would then plug into the motherboard. This allowed me to connect the Arduino to USB without routing a cable outside of the case. I made sure to test this out before installing, and following the guide made it super simple. To remove the original potentiometer, I had to desolder a bunch of connections and pull it out. Once this was done, I could slide the rotary encoder in and tighten it down with the included nut. The original knob had an opening that was slightly too small, so I hauled out the knob's opening a little with a drill bit, and that made it fit just fine. This allows the system to maintain the original look while being able to adjust the PC's volume and play and pause music, all from the original volume knob. Once all done, there were a lot of cables and wires on the front panel, but I did my best to make everything look neat and clean. While the mounting for the parts was figured out and the front panel was all done, I still had some work to do. Because the standoffs and screws stuck out from the bottom panel, I needed to make some feet to prop the system up. I used this two foot piece of oak that I measured the size I needed, cut the pieces down to size, then cut bevels in each piece. This left me with two identical wood feet, one for each side. I clamped the feet to the bottom panel, drilled holes, countersunk the metal with larger bits, then put a screw into each hole. I still need to stain these a darker color to match the rest of the exterior wood, but for now they work fine. Speaking of the rest of the exterior wood, let's talk about the broken outer panel. To fix this, I used some wood glue and right angle clamps to hold the pieces together and create a strong joint. After clamping this down, I went ahead and let it dry overnight. Unclamping everything, I found the panel was back to a usable state, but it still needed to be modded a little bit further. Because the bolts from the GPU mount stuck out, I had to drill little pockets for them to slip into to allow the outer wood cover to fit flush to the metal case. I did this by making a paper template, transferring the template to the wood cover, then drilling appropriate size divots for the bolt heads to rest into. This works great and allows the panel to slip on and off easily and allows it to sit flush to the other panels. I then started to make a back frame out of aluminum but wasn't able to finish it, which I will eventually do. With everything done, it was time for the final, for now, assembly. This went smooth and I was super happy to see everything come together and all of the parts fit in. With all this being said, it's probably a good time to tell you about each of the parts, then talk about the OS games and applications, one of which is today's sponsor, Dashlane. So around two months ago, I had two of my accounts hacked basically simultaneously. Luckily, none of my information was stolen, but lo and behold, both accounts used the exact same password. This was a wake up call for me and made me realize I needed a better system for creating and storing passwords, and that's where Dashlane comes in. Dashlane can store, autofill, and generate passwords with ease, which is great for someone like me who is constantly forgetting them and having to reset passwords all the time. Dashlane's actually free on one device forever, but opting for premium allows you to use Dashlane on all of your devices, as well as gives you a number of other features. Beyond just managing your passwords, Dashlane actually has a VPN built in which allows you to surf the web safely and securely. There's dark web monitoring that allows you to see if any of your information has been stolen and is up on the dark web. And one of my favorite features is being able to change passwords with just one click of a mouse. By using my link in the description, you're gonna get a 30 day free trial of Dashlane Premium, which is completely risk free because you don't even need to put in any payment information when you sign up. Again, make sure to click the link in the description to get a 30 day trial of Dashlane Premium and also to support the channel. Thanks again to Dashlane for sponsoring this video.
So now let's get into the parts that make up this epic home theater gaming PC, starting with the CPU. This probably won't be a surprise to many, but what I went with is the Ryzen 5 3600. This right now is the best value for the money gaming CPU on the market. For a little under $200, you're getting a 6-core, 12-thread, overclockable CPU that provides incredible performance. This CPU comes close to many of the Intel CPUs that cost pretty much double its price. Not only this, but it comes bundled with a decent stock cooler that can even handle a mild overclock. The IPC of this CPU is great, and the rumor is that the next-gen Ryzen CPUs are going to be even better. But those next-gen CPUs aren't out yet, so for now, picking the Ryzen 5 3600 for this build was a no-brainer. Brainer. Moving on to the motherboard, I went with the ASRock B350 Wi-Fi slash AC. I've had this board for a while and it works great. I did need to update the BIOS, but after that, the 3600 worked great with it. It's your typical ITX motherboard with two DIMM slots. It has an adequate VRM setup and the headers are all in logical locations to allow for decent cable management. I'm not the biggest fan of the red and black design, but they changed this for the B450 version. And I think the B450 version of this board is the best bang for the buck Ryzen ITX board on the market. For RAM, I just used a 16GB kit of Team Group DDR4 memory at 3200MHz. This works well at its rated speeds and at CL16. 3200MHz is a good sweet spot for price to performance DDR4 RAM meant to be used with a Ryzen CPU. And 16GB is pretty much all you're going to need for gaming for the next year or so. For storage, I'm starting out very basic, but we'll be doing more upgrades to storage in part 2 of this video. For now, I'm using a 500GB NVMe M.2 drive in the form of this OCZ VX400. This is a relatively old NVMe drive, but performance-wise is still really good and it's still pretty overkill for gaming. I'm thinking of trying to fit a drive cage that could hold multiple 2.5-inch drives and a 3.5-inch drive for mass storage. This would allow for the storage for a lot of games and media on this PC, which would be ideal for its intended purpose. For the graphics card, I'm using a dual fan NVIDIA RTX 2080 Super from Zotac. This is an incredibly powerful card and will be able to play a lot of games at 4K, which is great because of how prevalent 4K TVs are now in late 2019. It's great for VR too, and overall it works perfect for this build. Also, it's reference size, which means that it isn't super big, which was very important because even a card that was one inch longer may not have fit. This card stays relatively cool and quiet, and overall is a great fit for this system. Powering the system is a 550 watt 80 plus gold EVGA Supernova G3. 500 watts is plenty for this system, and the 80 plus gold efficiency is nice to have. It's a modular unit, which helped a little in cutting down on the cable clutter, but I think a set of custom length cables could make things a lot cleaner. Overall, with all these parts combined, this system performs great in gaming, in VR, and pretty much anything else you might want to do on a home theater PC. I didn't have time to benchmark this system for this video, but full benchmarks for a ton of games will be in part 2, and that video will be out within 2 weeks. So make sure you're subscribed to be notified when that comes out. Even though this mod isn't perfect or completely finished, I'm super proud of what I was able to accomplish thus far. If there are other changes or modifications you think I should make to this system, them, let me know in the comment section down below. I hope you guys enjoyed this video because I definitely enjoyed making it, and if you did, make sure to give it a thumbs up and also consider subscribing. And as always, this is Matt from Tech by Matt, signing out.